It's always a little dangerous to be the last presenter of the day because you're always concerned, has everything been said? Uh, yes, it has, but there's more to come. What I want to talk about this afternoon is something that we talk about a, a lot lately, particularly with the NSA stuff going on, is the signal and the noise. And what we need to be able to do is to be able to interpret what is signal and what is noise. I'm going to show you a one-minute video clip that change the way I think about the signal and the noise. And what this video clip is, it's the Olympics. And you only get to do it once every four years. And you're with your horse, and your horse is supposed to jump. But your horse doesn't jump. So you go again, and you try to get the horse to jump, but the horse doesn't jump. What you'll see she does now is she takes her crop, which is the equestrian equivalent of a copay, and tries to direct that horse to do it again. Now you can see she's getting a little bit more frustrated. She applies another copay to the horse to get the behavior that she wants from the horse, but the horse doesn't do it. And so now it's really a bad day at the Olympics. You've trained a long time. You'll give it one more shot, but it's just not going to work for you again. The horse is not going to do it. That wasn't the learning for me. The learning for me was what the commentator then said about this. And the commentator said, this is obviously a problem of miscommunication between the rider and the horse. And I was sitting with my wife, and I turned to her and I said, I don't think the horse could be any more clear <laughs> than it's been. This horse is not going to jump. So if we want to do things differently, what we have to do is we have to start thinking about things differently. So the question that I asked myself, when the horse doesn't jump, it's a, it's a refusal. So what's a medical refusal? In Vidant Health last year, we had 308,000 emergency department visits. This is after opening many different clinics, having, spending a lot of money on communication, telling people that they shouldn't go to the ED. So should we find a better way to tell them not to the, come to the emergency department for non-emergent care? I would say no. They told me 308,000 times last year that they wanted to come to the ED for care. Now, Doug Wood told us earlier today that people do things for a reason. And so we ask, as our children do, why, why, why? you'll find that anytime someone is frustrated, they like to use three syllables, like the three syllable plee-ees. Well, as it turns out, Pachansky and Thomas have done a lot of research on this, and they've come up with a very elegant model about access benefit dimensions. And as it turns out, ED care qualifies those access benefit dimensions, all five of them, better than a primary care practice. Now, you might say to me, well, what about affordability? Well, 63% of people who visit the ED in America either don't pay or are Medicare or Medicaid. So the affordability for them is not a question. In our health system, we're 70% Medicare and Medicaid and 10% non-pay. So for those, that 80% of people in our system, that affordability is not an issue. So why are we concerned? Well, we're concerned because ED care is low-value care. And why do we call it low-value care? Number one, because it's less likely for the patient to gain the benefits of primary care. And number two, it's costly for the healthcare system. The question that I would ask is, is that their problem or is it our problem? Because if it meets those access dimensions and they go, but we blame them because it's low-value care, we're the ones that designed that care. So we're scientists, let's take a look at the data. I like to use cartoons too. And this is a person walking up, this is from XKCD, I, our children introduced me to this site. Comes up, pulls a switch, and is obviously zapped. This is where it diverges. On the left hand side, it's a normal person that says, I shouldn't do that anymore. On the right hand side, it's a scientist that says, I wonder if this happens every time, and reaches for it to pull it again. So if we're going to tell them again, we're being like the scientist. 
but don't scientists look at the data? Another interesting thing about this is every time I show this to the scientists, two things happen. Number one, they're not very concerned that they're not qualified as a normal person. <laughs> and the second thing they say is, I wonder how I could get that study through the IRB. <laughs> so let's take a look at the data. Who uses the emergency department? As it turns out, everyone does. Our government, and not just the NSA, is very good at collecting data, and they have some very good data on this. We get 43 visits per 100 population in the United States, a 120 million ED visits in 2012 alone. Interesting, not, under one year of age, 94 per 100 of population. Nursing home patients, 83 per 100 of population. People that are already in a setting of care have to use the emergency room. And the homeless, as we heard from our first speaker today, 105 for 100 population, which means that really providing homes first is a good idea. So let's test the assumptions that we have about an ED and that our ED providers have about an ED. First of all, people come to the ED because they're sick. And that's yes, but they're not very sick. 83% of visits to an emergency department in the United States are level three or higher. Most of those are primary care visits. 83%. So they're really not very sick. Well, maybe they come because they need hospital care. And the answer to that is yes, some do. Between 12 and 13% of people who are admitted to the, or that come to an ED are admitted to the hospital. When you take a look and break that down, 70% of those admissions come from people age 65 or older. And if you've been admitted to the hospital or discharged from the hospital within the last 30 days, you have a 40% chance of being admitted from an ED visit. So if you just took out those two populations that came to your ED, you'd account for most of the patients that are admitted to the hospital. The other thing our providers tell us is that trauma is a large driver of utilization. And that's really true. About 22% of all patients that come to an ED come because of trauma. What you need to know is that it's mostly stuff that your grandmother would have told you you'll get better without going to the ED. Only 3% of people need stitches, and only 0.3% of people actually get a cast for a broken bone from a visit to the ED. So what we see is that people are coming to the ED for really primary care. So the question is, what do we do? What I would suggest, if we're going to do things differently, we have to think of things differently. And can we use this as an opportunity to provide better care rather than telling them one more time not to come? Can we be more cost effective at the ED? And can we provide better continuity and prevention? A lot of us are receiving a lot of meaningful use funds. And those meaningful use funds are to make sure that our electronic health records really deliver on that continuity and prevention. Why can't we apply that? in the ED. As we know, system problems require system solutions. So we have to change those assumptions within the emergency rooms that we have. Now, we've spent a lot of time changing the, trying to change the assumption of patients, but we haven't spent much time trying to change the assumption of the ED design. What we need to do is we need to change the facility. We really need to change the training our ED doctors provide. Our ED doctors are programmed through their training that everything that comes to the ED is a potentially lethal disease. The statistics show us that that is not the case. So if we can change the facility and make it more primary care friendly or continuity care friendly, change the training to pe give people the training for the stuff that really approaches the ED, then we can change the model. And I would say that changing the, the hard part about this changing the model, it's changing ourselves rather than blaming the patients for making a bad decision, when in reality, for them, it's a good decision. So the reality really is for emergency departments, they're not just for emergencies anymore. The further reality is, and they never really were, people aren't needing emergent care when they come. So we have some choices going forward on how we design our care. Do we continue to bemoan the low value of the use of emergency departments, or do we change and increase the value of emergency department use? 
I would suggest that we increase the value of emergency department use. And how do we do that? First of all, we have to decrease the cost of care. We need to decrease the cost of care by knowing when the patients come in, they're not that likely to die. If it's a primary care patient, let's give them primary care treatment. Let's not give them emergency room treatment. And improve the health outcomes of the visit. Where I work is in the stroke belt, and North Carolina is the buckle on the stroke belt. We have a lot of patients that come into our emergency rooms for trauma, for colds, for the flu, and we notice that they have hypertension, which is the largest risk factor they can have for developing a stroke. Do we treat them for their hypertension? No, we don't. We make them aware that they have the hypertension, but then we ask them to seek care with the primary care provider. And as we already know, those primary care providers, the access that they can get from the primary care provider does not meet any of the five access dimensions. Our emergency rooms do a much better job of that. So we can do both of these things, and not only can we do it, it's our responsibility to do both of these things because we are the stewards of the healthcare system. We can change this, we can fix that. So another thing we need to take a look at is embrace the value of the constraints we have. Everyone tells us to think out of the box, but when you're 70% Medicare and Medicaid and 10% non-pay, that's a constraint. But it's also a fairly liberating constraint. We know that waste in medicine is hard to eliminate because someone's waste is someone else's revenue. Probably the biggest example we have of this is when we talk about low back pain. Well, how can I change the care of low back pain when it's good for the radiologist to do a scan and it's good for the surgeons to do the surgery? However, in this population, if you're not getting paid for the service, decreasing the waste increases the bottom line. It increases the available resources that you have to continue to care for those patients. So that constraint for emergency department use is really an advantage. The fact that we don't get paid for a lot of the care that we provide allows us to remove that waste and actually do better than we would if we got revenue for it. So when you talk about the signal to noise ratio, there's several things you need to know. If you get less noise, there's likely more signal. However, filters increase the signal to noise ratio, but if you put too tight of a filter on that, too narrow of a filter, you'll prevent any discovery that happens to be in the noise. And I would postulate that we have regarded patients coming to the emergency room for low value care as being noise rather than a signal. So if we're gonna change the way we do things, we have to take a step back every now and then and say, is this noise or is this a signal? So we had more than 120 million ED visits in the United States in 2010. Is that a lot of low value care? Or really is it millions of missed opportunities for better care? And I would say at this particular point in time, it's both. However, we're the ones that get to design it. We can change that. We have the responsibility to change that. This is a picture of the Ohio State University, and this is the quad. Now, there's always tension between the students at a university and the faculty of the university because the faculty likes the university and they want it to be green and they want to keep the grass. Well, there's two ways you can keep grass at a university quad. The number one way to do it would be to build a fence around the quad, but you have a lot of 18 to 22 year olds who have nothing better to do than to think about how to go over or under the fence. Or you can do like Ohio State has done and you can build the sidewalks where the paths already are. What I would postulate is that we have choices, particularly for emergency room care, and for much of the care that we give. And that's that we can either find new and innovative ways to deter people from using our emergency departments because it is low value care and they're not designed to give the care that people are coming there for, or we can build the sidewalks where the paths are worn. This is about scale. If we are going to scale the healthcare system for the things that are right, what we really need to do is leverage the behaviors that people already have. There, we do not have enough time, attention, or effort to be able to change the behavior of everybody in the United States. We regard their behaviors as noise. 
We heard several times today, why won't my patient do this? Why am I being measured on things that the patients have control of? Well, if you build the sidewalks where the paths are already worn, then you have an opportunity to change that. There have been different ways of interpreting information over time, and there's been a progression in the information that we have gotten and the interpretation of it. Back in 1500, John Dryden implored us to take a look at something deeper. We heard a lot about that today. What about the analytics? How can we look past just what we see and be able to get to richer information? In the 1960s, Marshall McLuhan told us that the medium is the message. How the information is presented to us is as important as the, mes as the message itself. And we can thank Marshall McLuhan for Fox News and MSNBC because he predicted it back in the 60s, long before it came along. Nate Silver has told us as recently as last year in his book, The Signal and the Noise, is the signal is the truth, and the noise is what distracts us from the truth. What I would like us to remember as we go forward, that let's make sure what we define as, this, as the noise isn't really the signal. We need to take a step back every now and then and say, what are people telling us? Are we just like the commentators about the horse? Or do we want to look a little bit richer into the information? So as we go forward and look at this, and we're trying to sum things up at the end of the day here, I think there's some innovation caveats that we've heard today. First, I would say take time to listen to the noise. People have won Nobel Prizes. They found evidence of the Big Bang, Big Bang by listening to the noise. The second thing is embrace and employ the constraints that you have. If something costs you more to deliver than the revenue you're getting for it, that's the first place to change and get the waste out of the system. And the second part is, because behaviors are so hard to change, build the sidewalks where the paths are worn. People already have those behaviors. They do them for a reason. Let's leverage those behaviors and allow us to move forward and provide better care. I'm going to end up with one more cartoon. It's about identifying the signal, and it's about missing things that are obvious. The equation, if you do it, it's a probability equation, and it really works. But the caption reads, statistically speaking, if you pick up a seashell and don't hold it to your ear, you can probably hear the ocean. <laughs> Let's take a listen. We don't always have to hold the seashell, because the chances are you're standing right next to the ocean. Thank you very much for your time and attention this afternoon. Um, you don't have to worry about being last. <laughs> um, I think uh, in many ways the whole signal noise discussion is really at the core of everything we've been talking about for the last day and a half. Um, just, just as abstractly as you can, I mean, what constitutes signal and noise in this sort of broad system? 120 million or something, emergency room, um, visits, uh, where's the noise in there, and what would you absolutely be convinced is part of the signal? We've built, or we think we've built, emergency rooms for a specific purpose. And we regard anything that doesn't come in the, the emergency room for that purpose as noise. What's the signal and what's the noise is a choice. Uh, in radio or electronics terms, that's where that really came from. So anything that doesn't meet what we consider to be our definition of something that's useful, useful is the signal. Something that we de decide is not useful is the noise. So we have decided that people who come to the emergency room for non-emergent care are the noise. That's a decision that we've made. And you think that that's an appropriate decision or that there's more signal in what we've decided is noise. I think there's a tremendous amount of signal there. We bemoan the access of healthcare in the country. We say if we could just treat people for their hypertension, if we could make sure that we caught the diabetes or the cancer earlier, that we'd have much, much better outcomes. We already know where the patients are going, and they're going to the emergency room. That could be our one chance in two or three years to detect hypertension and treat the hypertension. Interestingly, 
there are so many barriers, and we've talked about that today in healthcare, and having started at the Mayo Clinic and moved someplace else, I didn't recognize really how many barriers were out there. For example, if you go to a primary care provider at places other than the Mayo Clinic that doesn't have a wonderfully integrated healthcare system, if you come there for a cough and they decide you need a chest x-ray, you have to get in your car, if you have one, or take the bus, if you can catch it, and go down the street, have the chest x-ray, take the bus back, that doctor then gets the report and you say, oh, you have pneumonia, here we can treat this. No, I, I, know, I know that place, it's yes. the United States of America. The United States yeah. of America. So tell me why that patient the next time wouldn't just go to the emergency room where they know the doctor, the x-ray machine, and the pharmacy is there. Well, you know, that raises such a fantastic point because if you listen to what Arkel was also talking about and Dr. Ho was talking about, and then look at some of the other data analytics that we've been talking about for the last day and a half, I mean, it seems the impulse to go to the emergency room as a default is not a lot different than the impulse to listen to Dr. Oz. No. Or to go on a website and do a Google search of this weird thing on my neck. It's all the exact same hunger and yearning. It's a, it's a desire to release the anxiety. If I think there's something wrong with me and I think it could hurt me, or if I think there's something wrong with me and I could miss work tomorrow and I could lose my job, I want to know now. And I want to know in the quickest, fastest, easiest place to get that done. Now, we can argue that the emergency room isn't it. Maybe an urgent care center is a better place for them to go. But you need to understand if you're poor, if you're on Medicare or Medicaid, a lot of urgent care centers don't take Medicare or Medicaid. But, but of course, the them is us. There's, I mean, it's us, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, I, you know, it makes me want to ask the question, what did we do before there were emergency rooms? I mean, how did these questions come up. I mean, we talked a little bit about dragging the widows around the moat earlier in the old infectious disease days. Yes. Um, uh, I, 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 I suspect... about as well as the, what we're doing right yeah, now. Right. Yeah, right. I, I suspect it was easier to raise the question of, I'm not feeling well, before we had all of this infrastructure in some sense, even though I certainly wouldn't want to give it up. Several different things. I woke up in May this year and found out that I, 30 years ago I graduated from medical school. And the, that medicine has changed so much. We didn't have a lot of chronic disease 30 years ago. One of the benefits of medicine is we've developed these chronic diseases because they're not killing us. But when you think 60 years ago, when you went to the emergency room, your family physician met you at the emergency room. So you got that care. And the other part of it was there wasn't a lot that they could do for you. Either you're going to get better or you weren't. Think about what we do for a heart attack now, a myocardial infarction, and what we could do 60 years ago. A tremendous amount of change in the things that we can do. So we've become more and more specialized in that, that emergency room and gotten to be less and less good at the things that really people go to the emergency room for. And we thought we could solve that by telling people not to come to the emergency room or to build what we would call better options for them rather than the emergency room. It turns out our patients told us 308,000 times last year that there isn't a better option for them. It seems to me that, that there's this huge signal crying out for some much bigger, much more community-oriented front end of the healthcare system. Definitely. That everybody should be able to answer the question in kindergarten, if I feel bad, I know where to go in the beginning. Now, it's probably not going to be an emergency room. Right. It, it might be a website. It, it might be a, 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 a cell phone app. Uh, but, but that's the message I'm hearing from presentation after presentation today. Let's leverage where people want to go. And let's make sure when they do go there, they get the value from that interaction, whether it's a website, whether it's uh, the public health department, whether it's someone at church that has a booth that's set up on Sundays to check their blood pressure all those things. Let's leverage what they're already doing, but let's make sure we change our behavior as well as trying to change theirs. Right, well, you have to have the impact points to yep. talk about the behavior change, but, mm -hmm. but the impact points, the sort of entry-level points, really involve creating some sort of massive capture system to make sure that everybody asks their first question at a place that's gonna push them up the ladder in terms of finding the proper care. Whose responsibility is it for creating that 
huge sort of capture thing. It's, it's not the church, right? Well, it's, it's society's responsibility, but society has delegated that responsibility to healthcare providers. I think what you're talking about is how do we create an attractor? Some place where people want to go when they have that, rather than some place where people are forced to go when they have that. If we want to create attractors, we have to ask the people that we're talking about, what will it take to do that? We heard today with the smartphones, boy, we know people want to do this, we're trying to get ahead of it. We're not doing that in healthcare. You know, I hear a lot about, um, yes, we want attractors. Of course, marketing's all about attractors. But there's also a kind of a selecting out. We want the certain kinds of folks to be in our population of providers. There's not a, an understanding, or there, it doesn't seem to be a design question. How do we design an attractor that will bring in the bad behaviors and the good behaviors and make a functioning system out of that? That's what I'm not hearing. Whose responsibility is it to ask those questions? I think it's our responsibility to ask those questions. And it's our responsibility then to go out and build those partnerships. So if we're healthcare providers and our goal is health rather than just healthcare services, and I think we heard that very clearly today, then what we need to do is say, what will it take for us to create health? And who do we have to ask help us? And who do we have to help? What we do at Vident Health is we pay for the school nurses in Pitt County and surrounding counties. And we do that because, number one, the school district can't afford to do it, but number two, that's where the kids are. And if we can intervene earlier with things like asthma, uh, whether it's a rash or other stuff like that, that's much better for the, the student, much better for the parent. But we had to go out and talk to the schools and say, would you be our partner with this? We have a tendency, I think anyway, in medicine to say, if we're going to help it, we have to own it. I don't think that's the case. I think if we have to own it, sometimes we ruin it. What we have to do is develop the partnerships and allow each and every one of us, just like we heard everybody performing at the highest level of their license, what are things that the health department can do better than I can do in my clinic or hospital? What are the things that the school district can do better than I can do in my clinics and my hospitals? How can we build those partnerships and how can we not take control, but how can we facilitate and how can we listen to them just like we should listen to our patients as to about what we should be doing? Uh, two questions, um, just following up on that one. Um, you know, call me, call me a cynic, but I, I don't get the impression that 2013 is a moment of inspired partnerships in uh, public life in America. It, this is a moment of almost the opposite, it seems, like divisions, competition, fighting, I'm not listening to you. How, and, and we're talking about implementation of the Affordable Care Act on mm -hmm. October 1st, and there are states arguing over whether they're even going to implement it or not. Convince me that this is actually a moment for creating those partnerships. I think it depends where you start. I think if you want the solutions for healthcare to come out of Washington, D.C., or St. Paul, Minnesota, or Raleigh, North Carolina, that's not going to happen because the interaction that you talked about exists. What I see, however, at the community level is different. I think people at the community level, although there's always friction at a community level, to truly want to help each other. And the other part of it is they have the line of sight to where they see, or they, when they do help each other, how it does make a difference. So I don't think we can start at Washington, D.C. or a state capital and push this down. We have to start at the community level and push it up. Just like when they talked about violence. That wasn't something that came out of Springfield, Illinois. That was something that came out of interested people in Chicago that were willing to work one neighborhood at a time. That model worked in public health before on the, ep on the epidemics. Why don't we ha call this an epidemic of unaffordable care? an epidemic of a wasteful health care system? Why don't we call an epidemic of people not getting what they need and address it like an epidemic? You know, the idea that everybody who comes into the emergency room, even without an emergency, is an opportunity to intervene in health care, that's one of the most radical ideas I've heard at this conference, and it really excites me. I've got a lot to think about. Before we go, there's a lot of talk about chronic care among doctors and medical professionals and that we're shifting away from an acute care to a chronic care model. You know, I'm a paraplegic. I'm, you know, call me Mr. C, right? I'm, I, I'm chronic. But chronic care has no meaning for me in, in, in a way. It, it really just seems to be a restatement of the idea that 
Health is a lifetime partnership. It's something you're aware of constantly, and it's our choice to only see chronic conditions as an opportunity for this pretty much lifetime open-ended relationship when that's really what all the relationships are. It should. I think it's being framed the way it is being framed because it's the Eddie Sutton rule. You go where the money is. We know that 5% of the population counts for 50% of the healthcare dollars that are spent in America, and we know those are people with chronic diseases. We also know one of the first music we heard was Marcus Welby. The Marcus Welby You recognize world, that one? Yeah, Marcus Welby world doesn't exist anymore, right? Uh, Marcus Welby, by the way, Consuela was the one that ran the practice. I don't know if you remember her. And, and Brolin had the motorcycle. Yeah, exactly, came up later. exactly. Yeah, like when we came down dude. to all the difficult decisions, yeah. it was Consuelo. They really pushed the buttons there. But that was a different world because there wasn't chronic disease. It was acute disease. And the reason we come up with the term chronic care and chronic disease, because we needed something to describe the difference in the world from the way it was in 1980. You're right, it needs to be continuous. It needs to be lifelong care. It needs to be care when you need it. It needs to be care that helps us change our behaviors rather than chides us when we can't change our behaviors. You know, we talk about obesity, and we've got 500,000 years of behaviors that say, boy, if it tastes good and it's got a lot of calories in it, I should eat it, and I should save it, conserve my energy as much as I can. It's just 150 years ago when people were starving. I mean, think of after the First or Second World War. A million people a year died in Germany of starvation. We're in a relative new world of food. We have to change the way that we do things in order to meet that new world. Chronic disease, chronic care is just another way to do that. My feeling is that we use that to describe how it's different today rather than it was 30 years ago and to describe our frustration with it rather than anything else. Dr. Herman, thanks so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you.